Chapter 4 Quint pulled into the construction yard in his rusting green pickup, zipping his jacket up as he stepped out into the semi-chilly early morning air. It was that time of year when the hours before the sun came up were drastically different in temperature, and he was already looking forward to greeting the sun from inside the shed when it came up. The driveway of the construction yard was a long gravel path, and it was on either side of this path that the employees parked their vehicles when they arrived in the wee hours of the morning. Quint had parked in the same spot for five years, ever since he had started working this job. The farthest spot from the shed was his. He had chosen this spot, deciding that it would be good for him to give other employees the shorter walking distance to and from the shed. The makeshift parking was another thing that workers from the shed envied about the people working in the main section of the company. The people working in the larger, fully enclosed buildings were allowed to park in the parking lot at the very end of the driveway. The people working in the shed had to park on the grass, and had complained about this to management for years and years before Quint had come onto the scene. While Quint himself had never complained, he understood that they felt undervalued, given the rest of their working conditions. Today, though, the parking lot was filled not with cars from employees, but police vehicles. There were at least seven or eight police cars in the parking lots with their lights flashing, and several officers walking around on the property, clustered mainly around the shed where Quint worked. He stopped in his tracks, immediately suspicious. They found Philip, he thought to himself. He was right. Along with all the police cars, there was also an ambulance, and it was into this ambulance that Philip was being loaded in a neck brace. As Quint walked closer, he saw one of the officers carrying a small plastic bag that contained Philip's joints from the night before. Quint had not received a phone call from his bosses either the night before or early that morning, so he assumed that this discovery had just taken place. He was sure that Jamie would want to talk to him, so he looked around for him in the crowd. Jamie wasn't difficult to spot, standing a full head above the rest of the workers both from the shed and from the inside air-conditioned areas. Quint searched the crowd for his co-workers from the shed, suspecting that Jamie might be among them, and sure enough, his co-workers from the shed formed the closest inner ring around Jamie, the rest of the workers on the periphery. Jamie was in deep conversation with one of the police officers, and with a tall, clean-shaven man in glasses who was dressed in a long, dark brown overcoat. Jamie caught Quint in his sights a moment later and waved him over. Quint moved through the crowd, and his co-workers parted to let him through. "'What's going on?' Quint asked, doing his best to appear confused rather than nervous. "'I was about to ask you the same question,' Jamie said, facing him squarely. "'How late were you here last night?' Quint noticed the police officer, he now saw that it was a state patrol officer, flip a page in a small notebook and put the pen to the paper. "'Hold on, sir,' he said. "'We'll get to those questions later. What's your name?' "'I'm Quint Ward,' Quint replied.' then gestured to the ambulance as it drove away with sirens howling. Is he okay? He'll be fine, the officer said. Quint caught sight of the tall, coated man standing just behind to the side of the officer, peering down at Quint over his glasses. There was something about him that made Quint a little uncomfortable. He had a thick head of hair with a touch of gray, and even from behind the glasses his brown-eyed stare was intense and piercing. Mr. Ward, we're going to need you to come down to the station later today, the police officer said, scribbling furiously in his notebook. Quint nodded, not having taken his eyes off the tall man. Sure, I can do that. Not a problem, he replied. The cop turned away to talk to one of the other officers there, and the tall man stepped forward, offering his hand with a straight-mouthed stare. I'm Special Agent Simon Holler with the FBI, he said in a curt, let's get down to business tone. Quint shook his hand, not saying anything for a few seconds as Agent Holler continued to stare at him. Nice to meet you, Quint said after the pause, still aware of all the people crowding uncomfortably around them. Do you need something from me? Special Agent Holler was tall and not overly muscular, but his hand held on with wiry strength that surprised Quint. He leaned briefly and lowered his voice. Considering your talents, we've taken special interest in you he said quickly. If your interview at the police station tonight goes well, you might want to consider a different line of work. Agent Holler deftly slipped a small business card out of the sleeve of his coat 
and pressed it into Quint's hand. Quint was dumbstruck, and in those few brief seconds tried to turn Holler's words over in his mind to figure out exactly what he meant. But by the time he had recovered enough to be able to ask a question, the FBI agent had already moved away and vanished into the dispersing crowd. Quint tried to follow in the direction he'd seen him go, but all he was able to do was catch sight of a dark brown overcoat stepping into the sleek black car parked off to the side of the driveway. In moments, he was gone. Quint! Jamie yelled from across the yard. Quint turned and saw Jamie, Jamie's boss, and Jamie's boss's boss, all standing together near the shed, looking at him. Jamie was waving him over. Come here! We got some paperwork for you to fill out! Quint stared at them then regained control over his legs and started over. As he walked, he took a brief glance at the business card Agent Holler had just given him. It was completely blank, except for a phone number written in black pen on one side. Considering your talents. That was the line that had disturbed him the most. Had the government been watching him? If so, how long had it been going on? And what if they did know about his powers? You might want to consider a different line of work and they gave him a phone number. Was it a threat? Or were they trying to recruit him? This paperwork had better be for the promotion, Quint grumbled under his breath as he walked toward his bosses. So did you get promoted? After a long, pointless afternoon being grilled by the officers at the police station, Isabella's hopeful, eager expression made Quint even more depressed when he replied. No, he mumbled turning the cauliflower on his plate over with his fork. Isabella's shapely shoulders slumped, and her dark curly hair bobbed as she stared at her own food. They should have promoted you. You didn't do anything wrong. Quint chuckled as he leaned back in the chair. They had hardly touched the food that Isabella had painstakingly prepared for their date at his apartment, and Quint felt bad about not eating. She always worked so hard to give him the best of herself, but at least he knew it wasn't just him. Ever since they had become engaged, she had known about his powers. He had told her about them before asking her to marry him, knowing that he couldn't propose in good conscience without at least giving her the opportunity to consider. Of course, she didn't care about it. It was just one more thing about him that she chose to love, in spite of his faults. He had known at that moment that she was the one for him. Even so, her tendency to excuse his wrong actions was something that he suspected wouldn't last long into marriage. It was adorable that she stood up for him, he thought, but he knew that he wasn't faultless in this situation at work. I did lie to them, he sighed. I told them I didn't know anything about Philip, which was a total falsehood. I've been keeping this a secret from them for a long time, so I really don't think I deserve to be promoted at all. But honey, we talked about this his fiancée said warmly, her ocean-deep eyes resting on him. You said you didn't want anyone to know about you. It's better this way for everyone. She paused for a moment. But, then again, maybe that FBI agent, was it Holling? Holler. Right, Holler. Do you think he knows? Quint shrugged and thought about it. Not sure. He implied he did, but I was too surprised to ask him for sure. And there were people around. Isabella stared at him cautiously for a few seconds. He could tell she was deep in thought and had a question on the tip of her tongue. He smiled. Isabella typically didn't like to ask straight questions in a potentially tense situation. Quint was always the one who delicately brought it up for her and gave her the chance to respond. But she had been working up the courage to be more direct with him when the moment required it, and also when she was intensely curious. His smile apparently told her that it was fine to ask her question, and she went for it. Are you going to call the number on the card? That had been Quint's question all day and all evening. Again, he shrugged. I'm not really sure if I should. Do you think it's a trap? Quint shrugged a third time, and Isabella squirmed in her seat. Mm, I don't like it when you shrug so much in one conversation. It makes me think that neither of us knows the answer. Quint laughed. That's okay, Bella, he said. It's not bad to admit that we don't know anything. But this is big, she exclaimed. Honey, the FBI might know something about you. Isn't it worth the chance to find out? Yeah, I thought about that. But if they don't know anything, then 
What if they're just trying to trick me into revealing myself? So you do think it's a trap? Like I said, Bella, I don't know, Quint sighed. Isabella frowned, then stood and walked over to where Quint was sitting. She came up behind him and put her arms around him, hugging him and resting her head on top of his. Well, you know that whatever you decide, I'll support you completely, she told him. He felt her melodic voice against his head, soothing his tired thoughts. I'm really grateful and flattered that you chose to share your secret with me, you know. Quint grinned. How could he not know? She told him that, almost without fail, every time they were together, which was almost every day. He put his hand on hers. Thanks, Bella, he said contentedly. That means a lot. I know, she sighed dreamily. But when you do decide, you better call me before you call the FBI, okay? Nah, Quint whispered. I'll just leave in secret and forget about you. What? No, not really. Isabella took his cheeks in her hands and touched her forehead to his, a giggle forcing its way out from behind her wide smile. But then she jumped a little. There was a soft knock at the apartment door. Both of them froze. Quint, ever the optimist, tried to come up with a plausible, harmless scenario. Did the mail come yet today? Honey, it's 8.30 at night, Isabella whispered fearfully. So much for optimism. Quint Ward? This is Officer Dixon from the Heford City Police Department. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the incident at the construction yard today. Quint stood up, Isabella clutching his arm. He stared at the door, trying to imagine the officer on the other side by the sound of his voice. Probably an older male. Isabella took his hand and led him toward the door. Baby, you haven't done anything wrong, she whispered to him. Just be yourself. Quint gulped down his fear and nodded, taking a deep breath and walking toward the door. He opened it and saw what he expected to see. A uniformed police officer standing in the hallway outside his door, his hands on his belt. He was middle-aged, with a perfectly kept mustache and short-cut hair. He was also big, bigger than Quint. Slightly chubby, but obviously very muscular. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Ward, but do you mind if I come in and ask you a few questions? Quint hesitated. If you like, officer. But I already told your department everything I know about what happened at my workplace. I was at your station earlier today. The policeman nodded, not backing away. Actually, to tell you the truth, we seem to have misplaced your statement. Do you mind if I come in so you can tell it to me again? I'd rather not broadcast it to your neighbors. Quint leaned forward, noticing that a few of his nosier neighbors were peering out into the hallway. Quint was respected among the residents of this apartment complex, and this visit from the HCPD was sure to provide a good bit of gossip material for the local busybodies. All right then, officer, come on in, Quint sighed, stepping aside. The officer, his badge said Dixon, stepped into the apartment, removing his hat professionally as he crossed the threshold. Much appreciated, Mr. Ward, he said, noticing the woman standing by the table, staring at him with dread. That's my fiancée, Isabella, Quint informed the officer, walking over to her. Please, have a seat. As Officer Dixon sat at the table, Isabella seemed to come back to herself and sprung into hospitality mode. She immediately grabbed the dishes from the table and put them onto the counter, then turned to the seated police officer. Would you like something to drink, officer? She asked sweetly, her hands clasped in front of her. Officer Dixon smiled, politely declining, as Quint sat at the table across from him. Officer Dixon pulled out a big yellow legal pad and flipped through it. There was plenty of writing on the first several pages, and Quint eyed it carefully, then he noticed something strange. A word jumped out at him. Then something that was scratched out. His eyes grew wide. He had written those words just hours before. He could recognize his own chicken scratch handwriting anywhere. That was his statement. Well, would you look at that, Officer Dixon exclaimed, a big smile breaking out across his face. There's your statement. I had it this whole time. Quentin Isabella traded glances. He was very uneasy. She was positively terrified. The officer leaned forward and placed the yellow pad on the table in front of him, looking serious but in a warm, non-threatening way. I'm sorry for the deception, Mr. Ward, and I'm sorry for interrupting your dinner with your fiancé. It smells delicious. 
But when I showed your picture to my assistant back at the house, I knew I had to come find you before the end of the day today. I don't understand, Quint said, reaching over to hold Isabella's shaking hand. Officer Dixon smiled. Please call me Atlas. And don't worry, the secret of your powers is safe with me. I have my own gifts too. Quint's eyes grew wide. You're joking. Not at all, Atlas said with a huge grin. Prove it! Isabella blurted out uncharacteristically. Atlas nodded affirmatively. All right, then. Quint stood to his feet and moved in between Atlas and Isabella as the officer placed his hands on the wooden table. He breathed in and closed his eyes as Quint's stare remained fixed on the police officer. Quint's mouth dropped open. As he stood there and watched, the change began in Atlas's fingers and moved up his arms to spread to his neck and face and presumably his entire body beneath his clothes. In moments, Atlas's skin was identical in color and substance to the wood of the kitchen table. Looking up, the officer laughed at the expression on Quince and Isabella's faces. The sound of his voice was grainy and creaking, like an old wooden house with beams bending under a strong wind. Wow, this is an old table, Atlas concluded. Quint stepped forward, his mouth hanging open. The man's hair was solid wood. His eyes, moving in their sockets, were made from a different shade of wood than his face. Even the irises and pupils were slightly different colors. That's amazing, Isabella said faintly. That's stinking awesome, Quint whispered. Atlas wrapped his knuckles against his own leg, and it sounded exactly like the knock on the door he'd just given moments earlier. Knock on wood, he chuckled. Quint stood back, his hands on his hips. He locked eyes with Atlas for a moment as the man let out a breath and changed back to his regular flesh-and-bone self, which took even less time than it had to change in the first place. Quint sat back down at the table, and Isabella took a seat in the chair next to him. Well, uh, Mr. Dixon, that was pretty cool, he said, still stunned. You have our full and undivided attention now. Well, what else did you want to discuss?